We're pleased to have Keith Wilson, Associate Professor of Ancient Scripture, as our speaker today. We extend a special welcome to his wife, Linda, and their family members and friends who are here. Brother Wilson teaches classes in Book of Mormon, New Testament, and Old Testament. He was born and raised in the high desert area of, of Southern California. He is the fourth of ten children. Following his service as a missionary in Vienna, Austria, Dr. Wilson completed his undergraduate studies at BYU in German and health science. He also holds a master's degree from BYU and a PhD from the University of Utah. His doctoral studies focused on the history and influence of religion in higher education in America. Brother Wilson and his wife Linda are the parents of eight children and 20 grandchildren. Now we'll be pleased to hear from Brother Wilson. As I approach my speaking assignment this morning, I was reminded of this note that I received from one of my students. And I quote, Brother Wilson, I just wanted to let you know that I won't be in class today. I am interviewing applicants for a campus position. I apologize for the absence. And then, as if this student wanted to soften the blow, she added, I really like missing your class. <laughs> Signed, a devoted student. I assume from your presence here this morning uh, that you did not get the, my student's memo. <laughs> Sixteen years ago, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf gave a profound conference talk entitled, You Matter to Him. In his talk, he contrasted God as the, great, as the creator of all things and yet concerned about each one of us individually. Today I'd like to build upon, build upon his topic and title my remarks, BYU Matters to Him. However, I would like to redefine the acronym for Brigham Young University as BYU, as in U spelled Y-O-U. Thus, the title of my address is BYU Matter to Him. This past semester, one of my students submitted the following account. With her permission, I share her tender feelings about her first day of school here at the Y. Leaving everything you have known for the entirety of your life to attend a university that's 547 miles away is difficult. You can no longer lean on the support of your family and friends. You can no longer enjoy the safety and security of your home. You can no longer simply follow your parents. Your life is in your own hands, and it is terrifying. I distinctly remember, she said, the hurricane of emotions I experienced as I bid farewell to my dad as he drove away, leaving me standing outside my dorm with five people that I had never met. I had to make my own food, and I felt sorely unprepared. Actually, I felt more than unprepared. I felt absolutely and entirely lost. My student then described her feelings that day as those of ultimate vulnerability. As I pondered my student's feelings of vulnerability and isolation, I felt a personal surge of deja vu to when I first arrived at BYU some <clears throat> 47 years ago. Her account stirred within me some painful emotions from decades past. I suspect that many of you here today can also recall the daunting feelings our memories of when you first arrived on this campus. Perhaps some of you are find yourself in the throes of similar feelings of trepidation or being lost as I address you today. Without minimizing these feelings of loneliness or intimidation, they present a marked contrast to the feelings we had when we were first accepted to BYU. Consider the following glossy accolades and advantages of attending Brigham Young University. BYU consistently ranks in the top 25 percent of all national universities. Furthermore, BYU is in the top five of the best value universities and costs $30,000 per year less than any other private school that outranks it. Consequently, BYU students graduate with substantially less debt. BYU is the number one stone-cold sober university in America. And students, will, you will never have to tolerate a drunk professor or classmates. Also, BYU launches more of its students into PhD programs than Harvard, Yale, or Stanford. That's elite company. 
Upon arrival, every student here has a church unit waiting to, wel to receive and to support them. Additionally, over 60% of the students at BYU are returned missionaries, and virtually everyone on campus can pass a Temple Recommend interview. And please don't forget, last but not least, that BYU is rated number one in the nation for students that are both hot and smart. <laughs> <laughs> and the list goes on and on. In some respects, if you are a student named Charlie in search of a golden coupon in a winning chocolate bar, when you received your BYU acceptance letter, you might have danced around in your PJs singing, I've got a golden ticket, I'm going to BYU. <laughs> How is that? Uh, so why then does this winning chocolate bar sometimes begin to melt in our hands after we get started here at the Y? Was our impression to come here misguided? What causes this reversal to occur so quickly? Almost five decades of experience and observation on this campus have sensitized me to some of the reasons for this BYU, quote, deflation syndrome. Do any of these sound familiar? First, the size of BYU student bodies, uh, while it's a reminder that this church is growing and dynamic, yet we often feel very alone in a sea of 30,000 unknown students. Second, the bureaucracy of a large university can, like ours can seem very impersonal and cold. Third, the high level of academics here, which we're proud to, uh, to acknowledge, can absolutely intimidate many of us, especially when we realize that we will be graded on a curve. How about this number uh, for evidence? This past year, over 50 freshman students entered BYU with perfect ACT scores. <laughs> Fourth, even though BYU is the world's best bargain in higher education, Fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars a year is still a chunk of change, and many of us struggle to know which bank to rob in order to pay rent or tuition on time. <laughs> oh, and fifth, not to be overlooked, and those things that can kind of cloud our our countenance here. BYU is the LDS mecca for marriage prospects, and yet the bulk of us don't even have a date for this weekend. <laughs> the number of things that can deflate our college bubble is as diverse as each person and can surf and surface any time during our years uh, as a student. But there is one concern that seems to show up often in my students and even in my own seven children who studied here, and that is this. Do I really matter to BYU? Or should this university more appropriately be called BY many? This quandary for most of us is linked with another question. Am I as an individual important to God? The reason for this overlap of these two questions is this. Prior to coming to BYU, most of us felt God's hand in directing us or bringing us here. Many of us prayed during the admissions process that we could make the cut. Some of us were actively considering other universities and had our hearts turned to the why. And some of us were even prayed here by our righteous mothers. Regardless of the mechanism, most of us seemed to trust that God wanted us here. So this is where it gets a little confusing. If God wanted us here, why then do we become discouraged once we are here? And if our discouragement or loneliness becomes too intense, then sometimes we wonder, what is God doing? Why is a loving Father allowing this to happen to me? Finally, this quandary can bottom out with the, with the issue of, does God even really care about me personally? You and I instinctively know the doctrinal answer to this age-old question. We've heard it from our first days in nursery to our most release, recent Relief Society or priesthood lessons. Scriptures remind us of this fundamental truth. Consider these verses with me. Psalms 8, verse 4 reads, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And then verse 5 answers, For thou hast created him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. In the Hebrew text, the word for angels is Elohim. Over 2,000 times when it is used in the King James Bible, this Hebrew word is translated as God or gods. And so it should be here. In reality, this verse says, man is just slightly below God. Plainly, if each of us is just slightly below God, each of us is very important individually to God. During Jesus' life here upon the earth, he openly described himself as, quote, the good shepherd, 
And then he added emphatically, I, I believe, and I know my sheep. Another favorite verse is the Lord revealing his purpose to the prophet Joseph Smith, very common to most of us. For this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Please note here that his job description centers in bringing man as an individual to eternal life, not even plural, men. His interest in us as individuals uh, is very clear. Yet as clear as the doctrinal dictations are about God knowing and working for each of us personally, these same doctrines sometimes dim or may not be very convincing when we face discouragement or loneliness at BYU. However, there is one story in the scriptures that demonstrates the Savior's interest in and love for each of us. For me, it represents perhaps the quintessential example of his acute awareness of us individually. The example comes from the Savior's mortal life and his interactions with the widow of Nain, a woman we learn about in the Gospel of Luke. As with all miracles, but especially so with this one, the context is vital to understanding and appreciating this incident. Having taught at the Jerusalem, BYU Jerusalem Center and been on site, let me share with you some of my personal insights. A brief synopsis of the miracle depicts Jesus intercepting a burial procession and miraculously raising, bringing a dead man back to life. But there is so much more to understand about the setting. Nain was a small farming village at Jesus' time, nestled up against Mount Moreh, which defined the east side of the Jezreel Valley. The town itself was off the beaten path, and access to it was limited to a single road. You'll notice the red circle here in this diagram or this map, and there's a little yellow branch just coming off that uh, red line that cuts through the red circle. That's the road to Nain. During Jesus' time, this hamlet would have been small and relatively poor, and by the way, it's remained that way ever since. At times in its history, this town has encircled as few as 35 homes and just 157 people, actually the size of some of the apartment complexes here in Provo. Today, it's home for about 1,500 Palestinian inhabitants. The account is only recorded in Luke, which is interesting because Luke reaches out often to the underprivileged and the disenfranchised. There he, he just barely states when he brings up this account that Jesus was in Capernaum the day before and had healed the centurion's servant. Then we learn that, quote, the day after, the Savior went into a city called Nain and a large group of disciples accompanied him. This sequence is very important. Nain is situated on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee at an elevation of 600 feet below sea level. Nain is about 30 miles away from Capernaum at 700 feet above sea level, thus requiring an arduous uphill, up and downhill climb of over 1,300 feet change in elevation and 30 miles to get to Nain. In order to walk from Capernaum to Nain, it would have taken at least one or two days. Recently, it took a group of our BYU Jerusalem Center students 10 hours to walk on paved roads uh, this route. This means that Jesus probably had to walk during the night in order to intercept the burial procession, quote, the day after. As Christ approached the city after a very taxing journey, a young man in his 20s was being carried out on a burial slab. Luke tells us that this young man was a widow's only son, and some scholars interpret the Greek text to imply that she has no other offspring, no daughters or, or sons. A large group of villagers accompanied her in this most un unfortunate family tragedy. Obviously, having a son die would be a tragedy for anybody, but consider the implications for this widow. Just what would it have meant socially and spiritually and financially to be a widow without an inheritor in ancient Israel? In Jewish culture, it was believed that when a husband died before old age, it was a sign of God's judgment for sin. Thus, through the law of retribution, God was meeting out punishment upon this surviving widow. In the Old Testament, there's an example there of Naomi. 
when she was widowed at an early age and returned to the land of her birthright, she bemoaned, quote, After all, the Lord is against me, and the Almighty has broken me. Not only was there spiritual and emotional pain, but this widow of Nain was also facing financial ruin, even facing starvation or staring it in the face. Upon marriage, a woman was assigned to her husband's family for financial protection. If he died, then her care was delegated to her birthright son. And her, now her only son was dead, and this widow was at the end of her rope financially. She probably was a middle-aged woman living in a small, secluded farm town and now find her, found herself spiritually, socially, and financially destitute. Precisely at the moment, at the narrow window of time, when the villagers were carrying out this woman's son to be buried, Jesus happened upon the procession and, quote, according to Luke, has compassion on her, end of quote. Actually, this might be Luke's greatest understatement. Jesus somehow sensed the utterly desperate situation of this widow. Perhaps she'd spent the night sprawled on her dirt floor begging the Lord to know why. Perhaps she'd even openly questioned why the Lord was requiring her to live any longer on this earth, seeing that children were a heritage, uh, heritage of the Lord or, and she now had no children. Or perhaps she was terrified of the pending loneliness that she was facing. We do not know, but we do know that he chose to leave Capernaum immediately, which would have required him to walk through the night in order to intercept the burial procession right before they put the body in the ground. Yes, when he saw her tear-stained face walking behind that slab, Jesus felt great compassion for this woman. But it came from feelings that he'd experienced or sensed long before he just happened to intercept the burial entourage. He clearly planned to be there in her moment of need. Jesus then told the widow to weep not. Unafraid of ritual uncleanness, he touched the pallet, and the procession stood still. I imagine in my mind's eye that they were mesmerized because they'd heard of this Jesus in that area, but this undoubtedly would have been the first time that he came to that little village. He then commanded, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. Following this, Luke recorded, And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and Jesus delivered him to his mother. Naturally, the crowd of villagers and Jesus' followers were awestruck as their shared grief turned to shared joy. But this miracle was not just about impressing a community with his power over death. It was all about rescuing one desperate soul. Jesus was aware that something was very wrong for this woman, someone who was a true nobody in her culture. Her situation cried out for his immediate attention, and even if he had to skip a night's rest, he knew her desperate situation, and he came running. President Monson spoke undeniable truth recently when he said, One day when we look back at the seeming coincidences of our lives, we will realize that, they per that perhaps they weren't so coincidental after all. Weep not. Young man, I say unto thee, arise.
A great prophet has risen up among us. God hath visited his people. Now I hope this woman's experience will be of great comfort to each of you here at BYU, especially when you feel rather insignificant. Jesus hurried to the widow, and he will hurry to you as well. Additionally, a second reason why I hope this account etches itself into your consciousness is that by coming to BYU, the Lord intends for you to bless others around you. There can be no other way to justify the fact that so few are, are admitted into BYU. You were meant to be here. And so if you can, as you intercept others, many of them will be discouraged from time to time. If you can tell them about Sister Name and how he knew precisely her discouragement and her great personal crisis, I just believe it will change night to day. He cares about BYU. My final evidence of this comes from the experience of a family friend named Mary Ann. She was raised in a devout LDS family in Wisconsin and lived for the day when she could attend BYU and have strong LDS friends. The time came when she received that acceptance letter and then she subsequently found herself as a freshman at BYU. During the first week in her Book of Mormon class, her professor challenged the whole class to read the Book of Mormon for 30 straight days and promised it would make a difference. Eagerly, she accepted the chal his challenge and diligently read every day. Sometimes she said she even had to read in the hallway because it was so noisy in her apartment. As the challenge was drawing to a close, she began to get discouraged because no answers had come. Even though she had good roommates, they were all absorbed in their own challenges, and her dream of great LDS friends was not what she had hoped for. To top it off, the weather had started to change, and the days were cold and gray. On one particular dreary morning, as she left her apartment to walk across campus to her first class, it seemed as if the bottom was falling out from under her. She felt so discouraged that as she walked amongst the sea of foreign faces, she began to silently pray. With tears in her eyes, she wondered if she could go on. She questioned why she'd come to BYU when things just were not working out. As she arrived at her first class, she took up her normal anonymous chair in the back of the room. It was a big general education class with at least 150 students in a theater-style room. As she prepared for the start of class, she looked up to see if the professor was already there. She, as she located him up front, she realized that he had been looking directly at her. Somewhat embarrassed, he looked back down at his notes and readied himself to begin speaking to the class. Then in a spontaneous move, he left the podium platform and climbed the stairs to the aisle seat where Marianne was seated. He stopped in front of her and said almost in a whisper, I don't know why, but I feel impressed to tell you that the Lord loves you deeply and knows you. He then smiled kindly and returned to the podium. It was the only time that semester that they interacted personally, but it was a game changer for this discouraged young freshman from Wisconsin. The Lord was indeed aware of her. She knew that he knew about her. I wish that I knew that the professor's name so that I could acknowledge his identity before our university audience this morning. Maybe he or she, uh, he is seated in the audience this morning. I don't know. But President Kimball's teachings capture Mary Ann's experience rather succinctly. God does notice us and he watches uh, over us but it is usually through another person that he meets our needs. This is one area where I believe we all here at BYU could improve. Did you, did you notice the similarity between my friend Mary Ann and the widow of Nain? Jesus reached out to Sister Nain. Our professor reached out to Mary Ann. Here at the Y, I fear we have often let the size of our school dictate our posture towards each other. Recently, my student researcher Julia Brown and I wondered about the casual interactions of students on campus. We walked the pathways at BYU uh, 
during class breaks and other times doing informal survey research. Fewer than 30% of the hundreds of students that we counted and passed by even looked up at us when we walked by. Consider our own experiences between classes. Or between classes. Do we acknowledge those whom we are passing? Or do we let our cell phones, our earbuds, or our sunglasses protect us from having to engage in ways that might be out of our comfort zone? Listen to the prophet Jacob in the Book of Mormon as he counsels us. Quote, Think of your brethren like unto yourselves, and be familiar with all. Granted, Jacob was speaking in terms of reaching out to others financially in the context of that passage, but I still believe his admonition applies especially to us at BYU. Remember, if we are to be God's hands as He reaches out to lift other needy souls, it will first start by opening our eyes and our hearts to recognize those whom we can lift. In summary, I do know that you of BYU matter to, him, to the Lord. Please never let our size, our professionalism, our academic rigor, or any other aspect of Brigham Young University convince you otherwise. Forty-seven years ago, I wondered if I belonged here. Now, in the sunset of my career, as I look back, I almost have to pinch myself because my stay here has been so rewarding. And while there are manifold blessings from my time here, one of the greatest joys has been to get to know over 20,000 of you on a first-name basis. In part, I have felt compelled to learn the names of each of my students, even in a class of 150 or 200, or with a semester student load of 6 to 700. Because of this absolute certainty, He knows your name. And if He deems it that important, then so should I. I leave you my humble witness that you here at BYU matter to Him. Don't ever, ever doubt that. The widow of Nain, Marianne, and I all bear testimony of this simple but profound truth. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.